welcome to Voices of the West. Today, we are honored with Ken Farmer, who, wow, I don't even know where to start on everything with you. You're a Hall of Fame <laughs> Western writer. You've got over 50 books. You basically get mentioned in the same sentence with Zane Gray and Louis L'Amour frequently. So, uh, hey, oh. welcome. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's something, uh, especially I, I really consider myself a newbie. I did not start writing until I was 69. Wow. Well, actually, that's not true. I did write a how-to book for my actors when I taught acting classes uh, back in 98. Uh, it's called Acting is Storytelling. And when I finally retired, and I'm here at the ranch, and I'm bored out of my gourd. <laughs> I miss the creativity mm -hmm. of being an actor. And, and all actors, everyone I've ever known, tinkers with screenplays. You go onto a set, and you know they, had, they give you the script and all that, and you look and say, who wrote this crap? You know, I can do better than this. And so you start tinkering. And I probably wrote 20 or 30 uh, screenplays, one of which wound up being converted or adapted to a, my second novel, ah. The Nations, which won Best, uh, best Adult Fiction. Uh, this was in uh, 2014. I think. And um, uh, I was hooked. I said, I, I said, holy cow, who knew? I, you know, this <laughs> is, is so much fun that uh, I've always been kind of a story. You know, I call it a BS artist. I'm, I will watch my language. Um, and I've always been a storyteller. And now I used to say I was an author. But now I say, I create illusions. Ah, I like that. Because if, if you know, make the reader see, hear, feel, taste, and smell. That's all illusion. Mm -hmm. And I figure that as I'm writing, if I don't see, hear, feel, taste, and smell it, writers, uh, the reader's not either. Well, I, it's kind of a dumb question to ask why you got into Westerns. I mean, your background is very heavily in that entire everything of that. But give us give our audience a little bit of a background there for exactly how you got well, to where you are here. Yeah, you know, the simplicity of that is um, I grew up in the 40s and 50s. We did not have a television until I was 15 years old. So every Saturday was double feature day down at the local theater. And once a month or so, it was cartoons all morning and a double feature in the afternoon, you know, Durango Kid and a Tim Holt, uh, Lash LaRue, Whip Wilson, you know, Wild Bill uh, Elliott. I mean, you, you name it, I've seen them all. And so I grew up with Westerns. That's all I knew. And um, my mother read to my brother and I every night before we went to bed. I, I, yeah, it was bad, or listened to the radio, which, and there were some pretty good drama programs on the radio back then. And um, she read me the, my favorite book, and is the author is my inspiration to this day was Edgar Rice Burroughs. Oh, very good. That actually now, inspires a lot of people. <laughs> absolutely. Well, of course, and, and she, the first book I got was Tarzan of the Apes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I looked at it, and it's a first edition. Ooh. Ooh, who knew? Yes. And uh, But in reading all of his 26 Tarzan novels and all of the John Carter of Mars and the Carson of Venus. He also wrote four westerns. 
which are probably the best I've ever read. And he spread them out. I think one was in um, 27, and then the, the next one was 33, and then 37, and then the last one, uh, the um, deputy of Cochise County was in 1940. But he was a member of the 7th Cavalry. He served in Arizona and knew the Apache. So two of his novels, The Apache Devil and um, The War Chief, were awesome. Absolutely awesome. And so he was kind of my thing. But, you know, I, I've just always read almost anything yeah, from sci-fi to, to mysteries to, you know, I've got all of Louis L'Amour's books, all of Zane Gray's books. Um, That's no small undertaking. No, it didn't. <laughs> and how, it, it's an odd thing, but the two favorite Louis L'Amour books of mine were not actually Westerns. Hmm. One was Haunted Mesa, in which it was kind of a Western, in which it uh, explains the disappearance of the Anasazi Indians in 1500 from uh, Arizona. You know, they just disappeared. Yeah. And a similar one, uh, the Californios, which he deals with uh, interdimensional travel and other worlds and so on. So if you want to say a little sci-fi, of course, you always get everyone uh, screaming and hollering and and I have been known to write a little sci-fi in some of my westerns they say oh westerns and sci-fi don't mix it's like cowboy and the aliens no it's not there's a whole genre of weird westerns that kicks in there well it's not really weird but if you look at history and I make everything that I write as factual as I possibly can and every indigenous tribe in the Americas and actually the world over um, talk about and and have stories about the sky gods mm -hmm. and everywhere you want to look at especially in the southwest and South America uh, you see the and a uh, counterclockwise spiral Mm -hmm. which uh, everybody says well that's the the uh, shape of our galaxy well how the hell do they know <laughs> they the indigenous tribes believed that the spiral was a portal to another world mm -hmm. dimension or time and that's all in their legend. It's not st stuff that I made up. And but I have incorporated that into a number of my books. Excellent. So speaking of all of your books, what would you say would be the best one for someone to start on as a first time reader of yours? Oh, yeah, I knew your favorite you child. <laughs> um, I really. I would have to say, okay, uh, the first one I wrote was The Nations, which uh, it was a Bass Reeves story. And uh, I wrote it with a, a close friend of mine who was a retired Air Force uh, fighter pilot and a captain, uh, retired captain from Delta Airlines. And we sat down and I, it's the one that I had written a screenplay on in 88. Uh, Mm -hmm. and we adapted it now you see a screenplay is about twenty-five thousand words an hour an hour and 20 minute screenplay yeah. a novel were you seventy-five thousand, sixty, substantially got a lot of stuff we got to put in there however since the only difference between a screenplay and a novel is the setting and the descriptions because you have to the dialogue is almost identical 
Mm -hmm. and that's why dialogue is so easy for me as being an actor for 45 years. Uh, I listen to how people talk. And I write, so many writers don't have a clue on how to write dialogue. And as an actor, you look, oh God, people don't say that. <laughs> so uh, the dialogue, when I write uh, a screenplay is about the same, but then you got to write what the camera would see, what the sound engineer would hear, what the characters do see and smell. And I let the characters tell the story. I make a movie in my head. I just write down what they say and do. And I'm a pure pantser. I got no clue. When I start right, I will start with a title. I'll just come up. And say, oh, hey, I, well, that's a good title. And I'll just start writing, but I create, the first thing I do is create characters. Because I believe characters tell the story. Mm -hmm. And that's also why I write series. I love to write series because I get in love with my characters. And I figure if I'm let, then the reader is, and apparently it's true. Um, and they want to know when you're going to do another bone movie, uh, story, when you're going to do another um, uh, martial. Uh, uh, Fiona Miller, which is one of the, I introduced her, a real character. And I use a lot of real characters and I always use real places that I have been, uh, to, and all of the, ba I wrote eight Bass Reeves novels. And one of them, actually the last one I wrote was Bass and the Lady. Now, in the process of research, and I do a ton of that, because I like to write factual stuff. And when you read that, you read it, one of my novels, you think, well, this could have happened. And maybe it did. Because, it, you know, I have a saying that history is not always what it seems. It's what whoever wrote about it wants it to be. And there is often as much of the imagination in the writing of history as there is fiction. Look at our own news, for example, today. <laughs> okay, who wrote? <laughs> they didn't see what I saw. Uh, but anyway, in this particular book, Bass and the Lady, and when I was researching, I ran across an article in the Fort Smith Elevator newspaper, night, uh, 18, 1886. Talked about a Marshal F.M. Miller, a dashing brunette of charming manners, expert marksman, superb horsewoman, and brave to the verge of recklessness. The only female marshal to work the Indian nations under Judge Isaac Parker in the 1800s. And nobody had written about her. Sounds like nobody, a not a. So I said, oh, this is a candy store. <laughs> I already have a backstory. Now, and, uh, but that was really all I could find. I couldn't find even what the FM stand for. So I created a name for her, Fiona May Miller, Deputy United States Marshal. And I use very similar to television. And my, my books are very script like or screenplay like. I write scenes, boom, 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 boom. I go just like in a, a screenplay. And um, I have spinoffs. And so I introduced her in the Bass and the Lady. And I said, wow, she's a great character. She gets her own series. So I began the Lady Law series. 
and she don't backwater to no man. And then I just go, everything kind of dominoes to the next series because I use so many, I use spinoffs. So it's all interconnected all the way back to, to Bass Reeves. All the way back to book number one. Yeah. Book number one. You have your entire and, universe set out there, all fiction, or all with real fictionalized characters. <laughs> well, they are fictionalized, but I use as much um, fact as I can. I wrote uh, one of my novels, um, Red Canyon, that I had uh, Butch and Sundance. And they were in the Oklahoma Territory. Now, you know, there's a difference between Oklahoma Nations and Oklahoma Territory. You know, if Nations is everything basically west of what is now, or east of what is now I-35. The territory was west. And the Nations, its alcohol is Ill, was illegal. It was Indians. But the territories, it wasn't illegal, so there were saloons. So um, anyway, I had uh, the had Butch and Sundance. You know, they what they had they came to Fort Worth, the famous picture of the Holden Wall gang that was taken in Fort Worth. I said, well, hell, they got to get there somehow from out uh, from Wyoming. So okay, they go through Oklahoma, and on the way they happened to rob a train a army payroll just happened to come across well i get this note from this guy on facebook he says that butch and sundance never robbed a train to get anywhere and, you know historian and i that's when i quoted to him history is not always what it seems but whoever wrote about it wants it to be Unless you were there, you don't know. Can't tell me what they didn't do. <laughs> Can't tell me what they didn't do. I mean, you know, part of history says that, you know, they, they went to um, South America and got killed. But yet his, uh, Butch's sister says, uh, oh, that was all a story. Mm -hmm. They came back, he lived, and she said, you know, they gave him, he, he died in, um, what was it? Uh, 1938, I think, Butch. 38. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, I said, okay, so as far as I'm concerned, it's free game. They could have. They did go to, to Fort Worth, so they could have stopped. So anyway, I created a, a story, and uh, yeah, it's I use a lot of humor. I love humor in my story. You cannot have drama without humor. This is the actor in me. You got to have the hills and valleys, you know? And um, so it, it, it's not serious if, it, if there's not some humor. And if you, if you have some humor, then it can go to pathos and drama. And, you know, all, you can create that, that because a writer's primary tool is what? The emotion. Mm -hmm. I don't care which one I get. I'm going to make you laugh. I'm going to make you cry. I'm going to make you gnash your teeth. You know, whatever it is, I want to elicit some kind of response out of you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Often it's good to contrast if you're going to have a really dramatic moment to be able to have humor preceding or following. Absolutely. That's the hills and valleys. I hate one note stories. You know, they're they're you know too black or just it's like like I, I just it just drives me crazy. So being I'll write what the hell I want. Well, it's we're people. We are not just a flat line that does things. We experience what's around us. You know, day to day. We we laugh, we cry. So if I make you laugh in a book, I'm going to make you cry in there somewhere. It's a good balance on everything, yes. Yep. 
what kind of Western have you long dreamed of writing? Say that again, please. What kind of Western have you long dreamed of writing? What kind of story, what kind of angle that you haven't taken on yet? Oh, With 50 I books well I could turn. Every one. Yeah, I don't know. I've pretty well written every one that I, every idea I have, but they just keep coming. You know, don't you I hate this thing? Where do you get your ideas? Well, hell, I don't know. I'm just, I can be writing along and all of a sudden I'll get a, an idea, another idea. And this is what happens. I'm in the process of writing two simultaneously right now. One of them is a one of my Southern Noir mystery series, book number nine. And the other is uh, book number three of my Cold Train classic Western series. And I just had the idea of it and boom, okay. So I stopped uh, and I'm on chapter 23 of the Southern Noir mystery. And on chapter six of the, uh, uh, it's entitled Toby Man. Do you know what Toby Man is? What is a Toby Man? I'm intrigued. Toby Man is the old time expression for a road agent or highwayman. Okay. They were called Toby Men. Which goes very closely to Boogeyman almost. <laughs> yeah. It's almost like Boogeyman, but T O B Y M A N. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's sort of a zorro looking character black uh hat a mask cape in which and then uh one of my characters and this is where some of my science fiction comes in even though i don't call it science fiction i call it maybe science fact because i you know the difference between science fiction and science fantasy don't you what would be how would you define that Science fantasy is Star Wars. They never tell you how anything works. Absolutely. <laughs> Star Trek is science fiction. They explain the warp drive, the, the uh, uh, transporter. They, it, it, all that ex is explained with their descriptions. As much so as that becomes... As can get. Yes. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So when I write, I have... Um, one of my characters, um, Bone and Lorraine, uh, which are modern day uh, detectives from a small Texas town based on real people. And um, Bone is uh, one of the main characters. He's 6'8", 285 pound, and is a consummate practical joker. And the guy I patterned him after was a, a real cop and and they if anything happened in the station they never had to ask who did it it was just damn you bone his name was bone and it was and so his name is daryl ulysses or du bone and everybody's okay if something happened damn you bone and his partner is a five foot three hispanic woman named lorraine and who is quite well endowed and he occasionally refers to her as double d for which he gets a smack <laughs> um and he's going to take her fishing she had never been fishing takes her out to um possum king in the moon lake which is west of Dallas Fort Worth. It uh, they dammed up the Brazos River in 1931 and created a hell of a lake. I've scuba that it's 400 feet deep. I've scuba in that sucker, and there are caves under there, everything. So they like I said, dammed it up in 31, filled it up. It's like a great lake. Anyway, but in uh, 1898, it wasn't. Uh, it was just the Brazos. Now, and I have written an entire book on this subject too. In 1897, April 17th, uh, a spacecraft crashed in Aurora, Texas. 
got the newspaper article. They buried the pilot in the local cemetery. There is a plaque there to this day by the state of Texas. I have seen the tombstone that they put. It was a uh, slab of, uh, of uh, sandstone. They carved a triangle craft and wrote, not of this world. Someone mm -hmm. stole the stone in 54. But I wrote a story where there was a survivor. And it was a female, a very diminutive female. She's four foot 11. I patented her after a lady I worked with, Linda Hunt in oh, Silverado, yeah. uh, Academy Award winner for Year of Living Dangerously. Wonderful lady. I loved her to death. And so I wrote this character. It was her. And anyway, they go back. He goes into this cave. I mean, they, they go to, to um, Possum Kingdom Lake. And they're there. And, and he drives. He's restoring a 1971 Volkswagen thing. Ah, yes. The thing. Yeah. You know, you've seen them. And anyway, um, they go there, like I said, she's never been fishing before and she ain't real happy. And he told her, be careful, you know, if you got to go to the bathroom in, in the woods, she said, we can camp out. She said, my idea of camping out is the Holiday Inn. <laughs> and, uh, but she's like, said, what's that? And she looks across the lake and there's a cloud coming. I said, oh, oh, that's a wall cloud. We got to find shelter. Because the thing doesn't have a top. And he said, well, he said, there's a cave up on this hill. And they scramble up the hill at the time that here comes the rain starting. And they go inside and inside the entrance are some petroglyphs. There's a buffalo and an Indian shooting an arrow and the spiral. Mm -hmm. And they go in, and it had been camped in for. There was some wood there, and so he built a fire, and, and the storm hits, and lightning hits the hill. And they said, whoo, glad we took shelter. I mean, he said, our skin's even tingling. And um, storm passes. They walk outside, and he said, my thing's gone. And she said, I beg your pardon? He said, my thing. Oh. The car, yeah, he said, and where where's the lake? <laughs> and she says, where are we? And he says, uh, pard, I think the best word would be, when are we? Mm -hmm. And they have been transported back, and I explained this through Einstein's special theory of relativity: that past, present, and future all exist at the same time, and. Uh, uh, the Indian, the Native Americans believed that you could go through a portal and get to one or the other, yeah. uh, and or other dimensions like the Anastasia went to the, the fourth world. Anyway, uh, so he had rescued and saved the alien, Lucy. Uh, actually, she had uh, gotten a uh, uh, earth name of Lucy. She was an on on her. Anaki, but her name was Anuna. And she was having to wait for rescue by putting a radio signal, which was going to take a hundred years by speed of light to get to her planet and where they can come get her because they get here in wormholes. But uh, the radio signal can't go in a wormhole. So she had to transmit and it will take a hundred years. And she does get rescued in 2014. But he says, I wonder if Lucy's still here. He figures, well, I wonder if this is back then, because the lake's gone. He said, that's the Brazos River down there. I know the hills. Said, let's go up to uh, Cook County, where she lives. And uh, sure enough, she's there. And so that begins a whole other string of stories in which there's always uh, Lucy there, and she knows 
that she doesn't know she's going to get rescued in 2014, but Bone does because he's from them. See, so <laughs> they enjoy being in the old West and they become deputies. And so I've got a whole series on Bone and Lorraine and um, uh, he, they happen to be, have their actual weapons uh, from 2014. And he carried a Smith and Wesson 500, which is a 50 caliber uh, revolver. Sounds like I've shot one. Sounds like a damn cannon. I was going to say it's a small cannon you're carrying. There. Yeah, it is. And uh, she uh, was an expert with a Kimber 1911A 45 semi-automatic, and uh, of which the girl that I patterned her after uh, was an expert with a Kimber 1911A semi-automatic as the girl was one of my acting students and um so anyway that started that whole series and as they join up with and he finds out well no i'm not going to tell that because i have to give the story away uh but he find he gets linked up with fiona miller deputy marshal uh lady law mm -hmm. and helps to they have to take care of some criminals and so on. And, and he uses some of his modern techniques uh, of which the, the, you know, she would not be aware of, but he is. So, uh, you know, it's just, I write very involved linked stories. together. Yeah. Very, very linked together and everything is dominoed. So this is how I do all of my spinoffs. Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, Bone and Lorraine are in book three of the new Cold Train series um, as they're coming uh, over to go up to get to see about the Toby man who's raising havoc in the Chickasaw Nation, um, which is the Ardmore, Oklahoma area. And that's just north of where they're from, Gainesville, where, where I live. And... Um, I've done a lot of research on the Chickasaw as one of their very close friends is the shaman or uh, the Chickasaw uh, medicine man, but he's also a, an educated medical doctor. But he told Bone uh, when he found out who they were and what says, well, the Chickasaw believe that if you go to the past, then you are part of the past and always have been. Think on that one for a minute. Good way to get around the time paradox issues. Yes. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, you have always been there. So, uh, and I do write one on, on the paradox issue uh, late, later on. Well, Zoom is going to cut us off here in about another three or four minutes. So where can we find out more about you and about all of your books? Well, they're all on Amazon. I used to have a, a website, but that got to be a real pain in the <laughs> bohunkus. Um, so now I just have a, a full page, you know, on uh, uh, Amazon, the, the author page, and I've got one, two, three, five pages on Facebook, including Writer's Roundup, which I serve for all writers to come in and join and you know got a lot of uh uh you know y'all's people's uh yes uh, most definitely uh, you know on there and uh you know we are all friends and everything i'm and, even tr following that one <laughs> i beg your pardon i believe i'm even following that one yeah so you know those are, are some just it's a good one and i'm very strict uh, you can post once a day and I'm, you know, if you if spam in or somebody's on there with, you know, all oh, services, this, we'll do that. I said, uh, if you ain't a writer, you ain't coming. No. Yeah. I don't put up with that. I'm a little bit of a disciplinarian in, in that fashion. Well, very good. Well, Ken, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. We should keep on going for another couple hours on everything, but it's quite oh, yeah. a more time to run out on this. <laughs> I can go six hours. You're the third Kevin I've worked with. Ah, very good. Kevin Cosner, Kevin Klein, <laughs> and now you. Kevin Diamond. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> A good, good company to be in.
Yes, it is. <laughs> well, again, thank you very much, and I appreciate you taking the time for the interview today. I enjoyed the singing and the big orange. <laughs> very good.